Hello, everybody, and welcome to this new edition of Jewel Webinars. This time we are in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and we're very happy that we have organized this webinar with our uh, pa webinar partners, Legal Hackers Guadalajara Chapter, and uh, the founders of the chapter, uh, which are Irving and uh, Herzain, will be invited on stage after uh, the Jewel team will deliver their speech uh, about legal tech. We're so happy that you are with us today. And let me please briefly go through the program that we will be uh, going to do in a few seconds. So uh, today the speakers are uh, Alessandro Parombo, CEO at JUR, Raffaele Battaglini, CLO at JUR, and Luca Isopoladon Daniel, CTO at JUR, and Luigi Cantisani, which is our legal engineer at JUR. Um, during the speeches that will be lasting around 15 to 20 minutes, please do as many questions as possible because uh, these webinars are meant to meet people uh, and to meet their interests and also to meet their curiosity. And the speakers are here to uh, actually uh, answer to every possible question that could arouse you. Uh, but please use the question tab, not the chat tab. On the chat tab, uh, you can, uh, like for example, uh, I could ask you right now if you can let us know where are you from, because we are very interested about knowing wh which are uh, the main cities in where we are, uh, we are we are finding people that are interest in, interested in the legal tech. But uh, uh, for the questions, please use the question tab, because that makes things very easy for everybody. Hello, uh, Rogelio, <laughs> and uh, um, you can also upvote questions. Hello, Anna, and everyone else. You can upvote questions. Uh, in that way, you can uh, express your uh, preference for the questions that could be answered by our speakers. And uh, obviously, uh, we love feedback, and we absolutely need your feedback to know if this web webinar is uh, working, is something that you like, is something that you would improve, and everything that you can actually uh, tell us to improve it, it would be a very valuable asset. I, I will be asking you guys to uh, compile a link, to compile a, a form at the end of the webinar, so that you can uh, let us know if you liked it and uh, what would you change. So, uh, without further ado, let me just um, please ask Raffaele to start uh, the first speech of the Jure team. It will be about smart contracts, and Raffaele, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Federico. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am really happy uh, about this webinar because I am the co-organizer of the Turing Legal uh, Hackers, so it is very nice for me to to do this webinar with a fellow uh, legal hackers uh, chapter. My presentation uh, will be about smart legal contracts. And in order to do so, uh, the first thing that it is important to uh, understand is what a smart contract are before going to a smart legal contract. And <clears throat> there is a sentence that I really like to share with you. Uh, that is, smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. The sentence is uh, um, based on two assumptions from the people that actually um, uh, spread this, this statement. Is that smart contracts are, aren't smart because the smart contracts do not learn and do not improve, do not change, do not... Uh, uh, learn something new such as machine learning or artificial intelligence and uh, smart contracts are not contracts because they are just a piece of code they are just software so they are not contracts actually in my personal opinion uh, this statement it is very catchy is not actually always true uh, because for example uh, smart doesn't mean intelligent. Smart means um, efficient, easy to use, simple. Uh, that is the meaning of smart, like a smartphone, like, like a smart TV. So there is no artificial intelligence per se, but it's something that is easy, that is simple, that is cost efficient. And contracts actually it depends. It is absolutely true that smart contracts are software. Absolutely, yes. But 
maybe under certain circumstances they might be contracts and let's see how this might happen of this presentation because next step is to understand actually what smart contracts are smart contract are not something that is born with blockchain as actually many people believe uh, because smart contracts were first theorized in 1994 by Nick Zabo. Nick Zabo is a computer scientist with a background in digital studies. And in 1994, he uh, said that a smart contract is a computerized transaction protocol that executes the terms of a contract. So is a software that executes the terms of a contract. This means that, according to this definition, smart contracts are not contracts. Smart contracts are software that act as a tool to execute a traditional contract. Then in 1995, Nick Zabo provided a different uh, definition for smart contract, saying that a smart contract is a set of promises. So he started to move from a pure software to something that it's not a software as such, a software per se, but is a set of promises. And he pointed out the meaning of the word smart, uh, stating that smart contracts are smarter than their paper, paper uh, version of a contract because they are a software automation. They automate the execution, they automate obligation performance under a contract. And he pointed out that no use of artificial intelligence is implied. So in my personal opinion, this is the first uh, answer to the statement that we uh, saw before, uh, according to which smart contracts aren't smart. Then, eventually, in 1996, Nick Zabo suggested a new definition of smart contract, stating that a smart contract is a set of promises specified in digital form. So he moved again a step further uh, to smart contracts that are less, less uh, software and more, at, at least, document if if not, if not contract. Then we have to, to skip almost 20 years to 2014 when the Ethereum blockchain was, was, uh, was created, at least the white paper explaining the Ethereum blockchain was uh, divulged to the public by by uh, Vitalik Buterin, who is the main inventor, main founder of the Ethereum blockchain. The Ethereum blockchain uh, was the first blockchain created especially for smart contracts with a built-in programming language called Solidity. Um, and Vitalik Buterin took the expression smart contract and uh, uh, and said that on the Ethereum blockchain, there is a specific uh, uh, permanent script called the smart contract that is identified with a, um, a, a, a code, uh, a specific code. And these smart contracts are account holding objects on the Ethereum blockchain is a text uh, expressed in, in a, a programming language, Solidity, is a software uh, that is implemented on a blockchain. This means that it is a software that cannot be modified, cannot be altered by the parties. And this smart contract is meant to automate performance under a contract. <clears throat> in this in this slide, you can see an example 
of a smart contract. If you look at, at, at the uh, left side of the slide, you will see an actual smart contract uh, developed in Solidity. And um, this is the contract tooth fairy. This basically regulates uh, the payment of a cryptocurrency to the wallet of a child if his tooth is in the status fallen. Uh, although this is, of course, something that, that might be uh, funny in a sense, actually it allows us to point out a couple of aspects of smart contract smart contract on blockchain, decentralized smart contract. Uh, the main point is that being this smart contract immutable, the parties cannot modify it. It is important that the parties, and in my personal opinion, the lawyers assisting the parties, uh, think in advance of any possible scenarios and they have to, to be sure that any scenarios is uh, regulated within the smart contract, uh, that the developer actually uh, wrote code taking into consideration any possible scenarios. Because in this very example, there is an issue. The issue is if the smart contract doesn't have cryptocurrency within it, how the child can be paid if the tooth is in the is fallen? There is no backup uh, solution because they didn't think about this scenario and they should have uh, thought about that. Actually, the other major point here is who is going to tell to this smart contract what is the status of the of the uh, tooth, and this is a very important matter uh, that allow me to introduce the concept of oracle. Uh, the point is that a smart contract is an event-driven software. This means that the smart contract, in order to be executed, requires an event, required a trigger event. This trigger event may be an information that is within the blockchain, so we have no particular issue in that case. But if the event is outside a blockchain, then we need a source of information that takes these these uh, data, this information, and sends it to the smart contract. We easily understand that this source of information that is called Oracle must be reliable because if the Oracle sends an incorrect information to the smart contract, then the smart contract automatically is executes itself and then, is, and then it executes the performance of an obligation the parties cannot alter it. The parties cannot go back in time, cannot undo what has been done by the smart contract. So it is important to regulate how the Oracle actually works, who takes the risk of an error from the uh, Oracle. And uh, you need to take into consideration that the Oracles may be uh, an individual that the parties uh, actually trust, or might be an institution like a bank, it might be a, the stock exchange, an index, um, or it might be a hardware like a sensor, like a GPS sensor. So it is very important to identify the, the correct oracle. Uh, to, the, it, it is important to regulate the responsibility of this oracle. Uh, actually, someone suggests to identify three different oracles, and if two out of three oracles provide the same information to the smart contract, then the 
the uh, trigger event is considered actually uh, uh, correct. Then we can think about the relationship between traditional contracts and smart contracts. Um, first of all, we can think of smart contract as just a tool to automate the, the, the performance, the enforcement of a traditional contract. So we will still have the traditional contract. We will regulate within the traditional contract how to use smart contract technology to automate certain, certain um, clauses, certain provisions of the smart contract because we can automate only provisions that can be expressed in computational logic that we can express by using if event then consequence uh, else alternative consequence if we can express a clause using this kind of language then maybe we can automate it through a smart contract the other possibility is that the smart contract substitute the entire traditional contract. Uh, this means if you, if, if you look at the smart contract, at, at the, the tooth fairy smart contract here, you see this is a text. Of course, it's expressed in, uh, in solidity, so with a programming language, but you, um, but you should imagine that you can actually use also natural language. So it is actually feasible, it is possible to draft using at the same time both traditional language and, and programming language. So it is actually possible to uh, write down a text that is at the same time contract plus uh, computer code. Uh, and this brings us to the concept of smart legal contract. Uh, because in my personal opinion, if a smart contract, if a text that include, um, uh, that include programming language, so that is understandable by a machine, a computer, also include the requirements under the applicable laws uh, that render a text, a contract such as offer, acceptance, meeting of the minds, a description of the performance and consideration. In my personal point of view, that document, that electronic document that incorporates both, both a natural language and the programming language can be considered a contract, a smart legal contract, because it also uh, it, it can be also understood uh, by a machine. Um, I see, of course, practical issues in applying all the rules about contracts. Uh, such as the ones concerning void contracts, uh, um, applicable laws, jurisdiction. Uh, I totally see that. But from a pure theoretical point of view, I, am, um, I strongly believe that it is possible to have a dub double face document that is at the same time contract and smart contract, computer code, smart legal contract. Um, so thank you very much for, for your participation here today. Uh, please feel free to, to, to uh, shoot questions at me. I, I will do as much as possible to give you a clear and correct uh, answer. Thank you very much. Federico, to you. Yeah. So at the moment uh, we have Rogelio, uh, I hope the, the pronunciation is correct, uh, who is asking for a question 
And I would ask if please everyone can, uh, uh, from the audience, if you can please use the questions tab instead, which is uh, here to the right, because that would be very helpful for us to, to organize the questions. But at this, at, at this very moment, we have a question, which is, um, so Rogel is asking if you are referring to Ricardian contracts. I guess this is part of the last part of your uh, presentation. That's correct. It's a Ricardian contract that uses specifically smart contract technology and blockchain technology. Um, the point is such, just as Ricardian contract to have a document that is at the same time uh, comprehensible for both humans and machines. Okay, great. So at the moment, we don't have any other questions coming from the smart contract parts. That, that may mean also that you have been very clear or either that we have a very expert uh, uh, audience today. And if this is the case, I would love to see some very hard questions coming from there. Anyhow, uh, I would attend another minute. If no other questions comes, I would ask Luigi to come on stage afterwards if you are okay with that. Let's give the stage to Luigi. Okay, cool. Otherwise, if some questions are gonna come later, I, I would ask you to come back to answer them. So, uh, thank you very much, Rafael, for your uh, speech. And uh, let me please introduce you to Luigi right now, who's gonna talk about uh, dispute resolution on blockchain. And please, Luigi, stage is yours. Good morning, everyone, or maybe it's evening. I guess that it depends on where you are connecting from. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about online dispute resolution. Uh, just let me share my um, presentation, which should be working. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Can you see it? I hope that it's working. Or is it small? How do you see it? Can you give me a feedback, Fede? See that, no worries. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about online dispute resolution, which in some way is a way, sorry for playing with words, is a way for evolving the way people can access to law and justice. Okay, this is the idea beyond the notion of online dispute resolution. So uh, I assume that our audience is very familiar with the notion of alternative resolution, alternative dispute resolution. Uh, but in any case, I would like to do a super quick recap. You know, alternative dispute resolution basically arise from the need of people for suitable tools for resolving disputes. There, this kind of alternative ways, different ways for resolving disputes have always kind of exist since the Roman age at least, even before and, you know, going through the century during, especially during the uh, medieval age where trade really mattered, the modern notion of sovereignty didn't exist and so the first real example of arbitration and other kind of methods that are used today as well, you know, came to light, were very used. And this tradition uh, is still here in a world where we deal with international trade, transactions happen quickly, and they basically uh, involve people and players from all over the world and so probably in your life if you're a legal profession uh you have dealt with mediation conciliation mm, hybrid tools such as arbitration the so-called med harb you know uh and so i believe that most of you have experienced somehow this method that are a sort of alternative to litigation administered by domestic cards. The idea is domestic cards are 
let's say, um, uh, part of the state's jurisdiction. Okay, they are the main way for resolving disputes, but they do not cover all people needs. And so depending on the kind of business you're dealing with, you proper need a proper tool. And this is the same uh, idea that explains how online dispute resolution came to light. Basically, ODR is a sort of branch of, ODR, of um, ADR. And in the world where internet mattered, where transactions multiplied thanks to the advent of e-commerce platforms, other way for making transactions quickly. You know, people needed alternatives and quick ways for resolving disputes. Basically, the advent of internet uh, and the advent, especially the advent of e-commerce platform, set up the perfect storm for the birth of ODR. Obviously, it's a natural consequence. Uh, but nowadays, I see that there is a bit of confusion on the idea of ODR. What exactly is ODR? So this is my tentative classification based also on other people's classifications. Um, and I hope that this will help you to understand how this huge family called ODR is evolving. So on the one hand, we just have online features, okay? This is not uh, an entire flaw managed online. No, this is just streamlining something by using internet technology. So you have a traditional procedure, but some pieces of this procedure are brought online, like filing case, virtual earrings, you know, just something put online. And then you have the proper electronic ADR, the so-called ADR. Uh, these methods are basically based on an uh, imitative or transformative approach. So the idea is you take a procedure that already exists, such as arbitration, mediation, negotiation, and you brought it online, but entirely. Okay, not just a piece of the procedure. No, the wall procedure. And you know, all of these experiments also helped the evolution of domestic carts. That's why nowadays we are kind of uh, getting to the to online carts. So carts that are not completely online, not yet, but are kind of implementing features that have been experimented in the ODR environment first, okay? So maybe in your cart it's possible to file a request online, maybe it's possible to deposit a file case online. You know, bringing uh, the conquest made in the ODR environment and using them for evolving domestic carts. And then we have the most ambitious segment of the uh, ODR family, the so-called automated ODR. This is probably the most ambitious way, as I said, because we don't have just, we're not just dealing with streamlining something or imitating something. No, the idea here is to, is the so-called automotive approach. So taking something and trying to automate it by using internet technology and algorithms, okay? Sometimes this automotive approach is applied to the decision-making process. In other case, it doesn't work exactly that way, but we will get there in a short while. But what I'm trying to convey right now is that uh, probably the most ambitious application okay, of the automotive approach is when you use algorithms and internet to create brand new way for resolving disputes. Mechanisms such as double blind bidding, visual blind bidding, and blockchain is a way to 
and smart contracts, of course, is a way to bring automated ODR one step uh, forward. That's the idea. Okay. So this is my tentative classification. Let's provide a few examples to explain the evolution of ODR and the transi uh, transition, the evolution towards blockchain-based ODR. So these are the first, let's say, successful examples of ODR. Well, CyberSettle was for sure super successful. And if you Google it, you can learn so much about this project. Uh, this was a fully automated ODR system. Uh, it, it was based on the so-called double blind bidding. Okay. It, this platform, because we're dealing with a sort of platform, okay. It was meant for resolving disputes arising out of insurance claims. And the idea is that each party, I mean, the parties to the dispute, uh, submit their own proposal. And then the algorithm, the algorithm tries to strike the balance between this proposal. Okay, so it's basically a sort of automated negotiation, kind of. Okay, uh, the mechanism used by Smart Saddle is kind of similar, but the idea here is that people are not aware of what the other party is willing to accept. Okay, so, but the idea is still there using alter algorithms to automate the way the dispute is resolved. So it's something that is applied to the decision making process. It's something that directly affects the outcome of the dispute. And then we have I cart out, which is something totally different. This is not based on automation. The idea here was having a website where anybody could file a case and visitor okay, became the decision makers of the disputes. So this is this was probably the first online uh, example of an online based community that both submits and decide disputes. Clava, and this is also important for understanding the notion of blockchain based ODR. Let's go ahead. We have also had unsuccessful experiments, which were really ambitious because they tried to use, you know, the technology beyond ODR to evolve existing procedures. So the virtual magistrate was a project uh, also participated by the American Arbitration Association to create a proper online uh, arbitration system. Okay. And, and this project was launched in 1996, so well before the rise of blockchain and the second youth of smart contracts, let's say. And the Michigan Cyber Court was ambitious as well because it was the idea was to create a, a proper cyber cart, you know, a domestic cart, so not ADR, but uh, based on uh, electronic uh means and on internet okay and it was meant for solving commercial disputes mm, explaining these experiments makes it easier to understand why we are going towards blockchain based odr there is still a problem out there that needs to be solved and that problem is access to justice and uh cost for resolving disputes Okay, internet seems the most powerful driver for granting access to justice. Why? Because based on estimation by the OECD dated 2016, uh, according to a report that is linked in my presentation, nowadays only the 46% of human beings live under protection of law and so under protection of, you know, cards because you don't have law without someone that applies law that makes it effective that in enforce okay but 
the the 50 percent um, is is uh, of the human beings is currently uh currently uses internet so this tell us something that internet is way more accessible than justice so what if internet becomes the driver for uh granting more access to justice and also for delivering justice at a low cost and this is where blockchain and smart contracts can simplify the idea is that blockchain and smart contracts allow you to implement algorithms to automate something look back at cyber Saddle. we had automation there yes automation was applied to the decision making process the idea is that automation can be used for something different the idea is that the blockchain and smart contracts allow you to create platform where communities can decide so look back at the i exam at the i court house example that very let's say primitive idea can be replicated in a more effective way if you have blockchain and smart contracts okay and also remember the, the virtual magistrate example well this technology can be used to replicate existing ADR. They can also be used to create blockchain-based arbitration, which was something that failed before, but it can be done way more effectively nowadays thanks to these new technologies. And let's make one last step forward and let's explain Drew's vision about what we call smart ODR. Okay, our idea is that block mm, that blockchain and smart contract technology can uh, make the system way more the access to justice uh, easier and can be used to lower uh, cost for justice. Why? Uh, because first you simplify the transactions. Okay, uh, and in everything becomes easier paying fees for accessing the platform. You can use smart contracts for locking the disputed sum, okay? And then, do you remember when Raffaele said the trigger event? Well, the decision, the decision becomes the trigger event that unlocks the sum, okay? So the disputed sum is automatically allocated. And here, you are removing one of the highest costs the cost for enforcing a decision. Why? Because the outcome is automatically enforced, okay? And you have to also keep in, into mind that blockchain smart contracts gives you the opportunity to implement a tokenomic models, okay? And a tokenomic model can make the world system way more sustainable and it allows you to provide for lower fees. And there are a lot of other concepts like using game theory for providing more, for providing economic incentives. And, you know, in such a way, you can keep fees lower than usual. I will not talk about the depth model, just know that the idea is there. Having blockchain and smart contract allows you to establish that model, which will be explained later by our CEO. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Luigi. Uh, so we have already a couple of questions coming from uh, uh, our attendees. I, I guess you can go through them. Please just remember to start the answers so everyone is aware of which question you're 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 answering to. Okay, here there is an interesting uh, question, which. I can respond from a legal standpoint, but I would prefer Luca to respond to respond from a tech standpoint. This question, the most uh, um, voted one, is basically how can we integrate any ODR platform with trade lands shipping to also have blockchain-based dispute resolution suite? Use of API possible so from a legal standpoint the idea is if you have an odr model based on blockchain this tool 
can be somehow used to complement, um, let's say, uh, the tool for managing the contractual relationship. So you can have something, okay, that manages the entire life cycle of a contract, okay? Setting up the contract, setting up the contractual relationship, and then going to, uh, and then resolving the dispute. Do you remember my example, something that I did, that I said just before, that parties can, uh, within a, an ODR, a blockchain-based ODR system, can deposit a sum, and then the decision by the decision makers, regardless if you want to call them jurists, arbitrators, or whatever, the decision becomes the trigger event that unlocks the sum. Well, this is super interesting to me because you use the platform for managing trade matters to set up the contracts and maybe to deposit some in escrow. And then the other the ODR system becomes the way for resolving the dispute and also to avoid the execute um, to go before a court to get the decision enforced. Why? Because the execution is automated. Okay. Smart contracts allocate the sum for you. You don't need to go before a judge, before a domestic court. Luca. I take the more technical part. Thanks, G. Um, yes, uh, um, of course, it's uh, possible. Uh, generally, what will happen is that uh, ODR platforms will uh, expose an API of sort. So any system can potentially talk to ODRs. Uh, this is exactly also our our platform will allow you to uh, integrate the dispute resolution within your platform. So you need to call you know, our functions and our endpoints to make sure that you pass the data from your platform, in your case, uh, TradeLens, I guess. So TradeLens can connect to our API and you know, we'll be solving the disputes uh, on our hand, uh, but you will get the outcome uh, at yours. Um, so that's the, the flow, of course, uh, there are certain steps which are a bit uh, complex, as in like a hearing, like an online hearing, uh, which should take place, of course, on our platform. So, you know, you might show on your platform, uh, maybe, okay, under the dispute page that you will have in your platform, you can show a button, which is like uh, attend hearing. You click on that and you go uh, basically on, on any ODR or Jules ODR, and you can then attend the hearing. So uh, it's uh, like the integration, of course, uh, can't be completely on your uh, platform. Uh, it could be potentially, but generally it doesn't happen because the flow of the hearings, the, you know, uploading the documents, etc. It's something that generally gets done on the host platform, in our, for example, Jure in, in our case. I guess, uh, Luigi, um, there are yeah there are a couple two, of questions that you can address yeah and one is a uh, really really cool because it gives me the opportunity to share more about your so i'll try to be as quickly as possible as quick as possible uh first question because it's super voted are the executors of smart contracts also called orac oracles mm, i'm not sure if by executors you mean decision makers so in a, an ODR, ODR-ish sense. But if that's what you mean, yes. Because basically everyone or anything that provides information to the smart contract, including jurists that vote a dispute, uh, are source of information. They are human oracles, okay? As per my presentation and Rafael's ones maybe, uh so different from oracle uh sorry from machine oracles there there can be algorithms or whatever but yes they are uh oracle if that's what you meant and then i would love to answer this question can i submit a traditional contract to an odr this is a very clever question the idea is yes if you have a platform that allows for that and so for instance within jure we are aware that not all contract relationships are still 
uh, native electronic transactions, okay? And so when we design the Jupyter platform, which can be used right now, uh, and it was used to complete maybe the first sale of a vehicle, Federico, I'm pretty sure that Federico can provide you with a link for this story. Uh, and so uh, in our, um, within our platform, you can deposit a traditional contract, use the platform to pay the price. Well, basically to lock the sum in, in escrow, okay? Then you wait for the other party to perform his obligation. If you believe that the other party has performed his obligation, you unlock the sum. The sum. If you disagree, if you believe that something has not well has not been well performed, uh, a dispute may arise, and at that point, the dispute is decided by other Jur token holders. So, this is how the Jur Beta platform works, and the ODR that I've just described is a community-based ODR. Okay, it's not the only one. Uh, ODR system the jury is developing because we are still also working on a proper arbitration mechanism. But this is one way to describe how you can bring a traditional contract and using blockchain for payments, securing the sum, depositing an escrow, having a decision, and then getting the sum automatically allocated depending on the outcome of the dispute. I, Hope that this answer your uh, uh, answer your question and gives you a better understanding of Jure. Okay, thank you very much, Luigi. Also for the session that was very interesting, I guess. And uh, as I can see from the chat tab, um, I can see that also people got really interested about the answers. And so we are going for uh, the last speech from the Jure team, and then please remain with us. We'll be having also a speech from our uh, partners in this webinar from the Legal Hackers Guadalajara, so don't miss it. Uh, now I'm calling on stage Luca. Um, hello, Luca. So he hello back. <laughs> Hi, Fede. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> and uh, Luca is our CTO, and he's going to talk, uh, talk about uh, the uh, concept of legal data. And uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Fede. Before doing that, uh, because I'm a very passionate football fan, I wanted to show something to our Mexican community, which they might, which they should recognize. So I'm a huge uh, fan of uh, Mexican football. So <laughs> I have this with me, uh, even though right now I'm in Bangalore, in India. Uh, okay, without further ado, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, Fede, are you able to see the screen? Are you, I am able to see the screen and I was also able to see the uh, shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, by the way, uh, a quick trivia for whoever from the Mexican audience uh, guess, can guess from which year this jersey is, I will give uh, a gift. I don't know what, but I will. <laughs> I think that uh, Juan Valente Merida is already on point. <laughs> so, <All right. laughs> today. Great, great. I'll check that later with pleasure. <laughs> Okay, so my talk will be a bit less legal uh, compared to the talks of uh, Raffaele and Luigi. Uh, I'll be talking mostly about uh, uh, a bit of the technical side of what makes uh, a decentralized application a decentralized application and the business and philosophical side also of uh, uh, doing an application in a different way because this is what we are talking uh, about when we talk about blockchain. It's a new technology, it's a, par a shift in paradigm. It's a different way of doing things compared to... Okay, so first of all, uh, what is a decentralized application? Uh, in, if you are interested in blockchain and in these uh, legal tech topics, you might have heard this term. So let's boil it down, uh, let's understand what it means. Uh, generally, in uh, current traditional platform and applications, what happens is that uh, whatever data is there is stored on a system, 
uh, on generally on a database, uh, which is uh, centrally stored, which means there is an authority that uh, uh, has access, direct ac access to that data. For example, um, let's take the case of Livestorm that we are using for this webinar. Uh, you know, um, chat messages or, you know, even this video stream potentially, I mean, it eats uh, their uh, servers. Uh, they're under their management, at least. Uh, they might be provided by someone else, but they are under the management. And they can access, you know, all this kind of data. And of course, I mean, it's on their, um, you know, it's on their uh, decision to do so or not, but potentially they could, uh, you know, access that data. Um, what happens instead in a decentralized application is that this part, uh, first of all, is decentralized, which means it runs on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer network means that instead of a single or multiple servers, uh, you know, arranged by uh, the platform, the host of the platform, it, you have a network that, uh, you know, it's generally open. So then in that case, we talk about a public uh, blockchain. And this means that the data is stored across the nodes of this network. So each node, uh, you know, uh, has a history and a copy of this piece of data, which, you know, uh, is desirable from a certain point of view. For example, it's very difficult to destroy all this data because it just we just need, you know, a uh, few nodes that are able to run the system and it, it's, it works. And uh, on the other end, you know, someone might argue, okay, but, uh, you know, this is my data. I don't want to put it publicly or something like that. And for that, there are mechanisms. Uh, another thing which is worth mentioning in a decentralized application is that the logic of the application, so how it works, it's stored on this network, okay? So uh, generally this is done through the smart contracts that, for example, Rafael has talked uh, before, about before. And this means that, uh, say, if I have a calculator, okay, normal calculator, which is, the, which is doing like maybe one plus one, I can access the smart contract code and ensure that that plus symbol, the plus function is working as expected. So that, you know, if I put, for example, one plus two, it gives me three. And I can go and check the code by myself and be sure that it's working exactly as I'm expecting. So no one can fool me and, for example, apply a, uh, a discount of 10% and then instead maybe applying just 1% because I can go and I can check the actual code. So this is, I mean, of course, I'm simplifying a bit, but this I hope that this conveys the message very clearly. This was from a technical point of view, but we have another point of view, which is more uh, philosophical, I would say, and also uh, business uh, oriented. Most of the platforms today, which you know, like Facebook, Twitter, etc., uh, they generally uh, rely on content creation by users, and they do make revenue streams out of the content that you put uh, on these platforms. For example, a YouTube, uh, it's a platform on which you know you you upload your videos, your valuable content, and through this content attracts a lot of people because maybe it's interesting and. YouTube is able to monetize that traffic and to earn a lot of money through that. Of course, YouTube recognizes your value in this uh, in this process. And if you are a YouTube, uh, if you have a channel on YouTube and you attract a lot of traffic, you get paid, uh, you know, revenue. I mean, they, there is like a royalty fee for the ads that are running on 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 your videos. Uh, but of course, you know. Building a platform like YouTube, uh, of course, yeah, it's a big deal. Uh, but if you just want a simple video hosting platform, it doesn't cost much to create one nowadays. So you could create your own uh, YouTube and you have basically created the same roughly <laughs> uh, technologies, the same platform. And what, what I'm trying to say here is that, is it fair that uh, YouTube makes billions, whereas, I mean, not really billions, maybe millions, but Whereas you are making a very tiny portion of that revenue stream. Is that fair? Is it not fair? These kind of questions are, are kind of being addressed in decentralized application because what happens in decentralized application is that the, the, everyone is a creator in the, in, the, in the application. So everyone gets like a fair cut of 
you know, the contribution that he makes within the, the decentralized application. So that's that's very interesting because it poses a lot of you know uh, questions like what if you know um, what would that what would happen for example uh, you know if we go more towards this direction towards this decentralization direction of course a lot of um, process current processes will be impacted mostly whenever uh, you have a use case which involves a middleman if I'm able to directly connect to the platform and if I'm also the creator of the platform in a way um, for example in the case of YouTube I upload uh, my content but the content is mine isn't my my direct control I can say uh, how much uh, cut I would like to have uh, from the views of my of the ads that are on the video and the platform can accept or you know reject that kind of uh, deal but it's open it's an open system I can op openly propose that uh, in that way, for example, we are removing YouTube as a wall because you are connecting directly uh, with your viewers and it's just a thing between you and them. The platform will, of course, get a fee for their service. That's part of the, the deal, of course. But you are removing a major stakeholder, right? which right now it's there. Whatever platform you use, there is always, most of the time, there is a middleman. If you, if you think carefully, there is a middleman. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we are um, giving more value and power to those that create value. So rather than uh, a single authority that makes value out of your work, out of your, uh, we'll see examples of that. Uh, we are trying, I mean, the, in the decentralized revolution, we are trying to empower the single uh, person, the single user that creates content. And this is very important to, to keep in mind. Of course, uh, there are several aspects of the technology that instead ensure a more transparent mechanism. For example, I gave you the example of the calculator. It's a good example because, you know, mm, okay, maybe not the specific, but the calculations. I want to be sure that, you know, if I get a uh, discount, that the, the actual discount that is applied is exactly that. And, you know, for example, in the web page that I'm seeing, it's not that you are, you know, displaying different information. Maybe you can put, like in, a car, in traditional platforms right now, you could potentially show to the user uh, discount applied, $100, and then, you know, total amount instead, it's uh, $50 of discount. And if you don't do the calculations by yourself, you never, you never, uh, uh, you know, uh, see that. So in a decentralized application, hopefully this kind of things can become more transparent. Here you can see an example of a decentralized application, um, actually a very big platform. Uh, it's called Augur. Uh, it's one of um, our favorite uh, projects, which we are following. It's a decentralized betting uh, market in which you can bet on basically any kind of event. Uh, as you can see, uh, it looks like a bit uh, clunky because uh, right now the technology is in its infancy. So it will take a bit of time before you will see decentralized application which are usable, which are as user friendly as an Amazon today. With Amazon now, you can buy with one single click, uh, right? But here instead, uh, there is a bit of friction. The technology really needs a bit of, uh, you know, it needs its time, its uh, you know evolution to to come, and the evolution will come with more people like you, for example, becoming involved and demanding more, more user friendliness, uh, and so on and so forth. Right now, most of the decentralized, decentralized applications are more towards, uh, you know, developers or, you know, someone that wants to get, you know, into the tech uh, more deeply. So, uh, making other examples of, uh, you know, uh, centralized, uh, very popular centralized platforms, you can think of Airbnb for example, and when you think of this kind of uh, platforms, uh, you should consider something before, you know, yeah, let's use blockchain. Let's make a blockchain-based Airbnb because it's cool, okay? Or because it's, yeah, I'm going to make a lot of money out of it. <laughs> before doing that, uh, you should ask yourself, what is the benefit of bringing, you know, a technology like blockchain in this use case, in this platform? And whenever your client, you know, thinks about using blockchain, always ask yourself, yourself, uh, does this make sense? Like, does it make sense to bring into the picture 
uh, decentralized uh, you know, application, or even if you just use the blockchain as a storage, does it really make sense for this use case? It's very important because uh, nothing comes for free. Uh, everything has a pros and cons. Blockchain, for example, it's uh, uh, very um, slow as of now. So you really need to consider you know, several, several things. And in this case, uh, in the Airbnb case, I think it can make sense to create a decentralized uh, Airbnb because you would connect directly the host with the guests and we are removing a major cut, which is currently the one that Airbnb takes. But on the other end, Airbnb takes a huge cut because it also guarantee both the parties, right? So I guarantee, uh, Airbnb guarantees the host that you know the, its property won't get damaged, and on the other end, uh, you know, uh, the guest of certain standards and protection and so on and so forth. Um, a more legal example for those of you that uh, are lawyers or legal professionals in general. Rocket Lawyer is a centralized platform that uh, it's a US based platform. I'm pretty sure that you all know uh, Rocket Lawyer. It, through this platform, you can make uh, any user can make the do it yourself contract. So I can just go there, fill a template, and I get a contract out of it. Um, what they do is that they basically hire uh, lawyers and legal consultants. Uh, on a one time off basis. So you basically work for them, you provide them the best templates of your life, uh, you do a great job, and then they monetize that. It means that Rocket, you do, they pay you once and they make money a number of times. Each time that someone buys the template, they make money. If you think of a decentralized application of Rocket Lawyer, it could be that uh, every time that Rocket Lawyer, this decentralized Rocket Lawyer sells a template, you get a cut. Why that? Because you are the creator. You are the one that provided the value. Uh, is the value the platform itself or the fact that there are a lot of templates that a user like me can go and fill? If I go to Rocket Lawyer and there are no contracts, there is no point. There is no value for me. But if there are a lot of contracts, then there is a value for me. So this is a good, another good case in which I see you know, decentralization should be embraced. Today, uh, decentralized applications are um, not so popular. They're getting popular uh, day by day, uh, thanks to you know major mainstream things like Bitcoin and blockchain in general is kind of a buzzword. Um, but there is a long way to go. Uh, if you guys open uh, DAP Radar, um, you DAP Radar, this website, you will see like a list of the major, you majorly used uh, DApps. And you know, like the highest, so the top most used DAP in uh, uh, in this uh, right now would have an average of 2,000, 3,000 users per day, which is nothing compared to any normal um, website or platform that you use uh, every day. Uh, even you know, just a, maybe a local uh, news, a local blog that you consult could easily make 10,000, 100,000 users. So that's the kind of scale at which we are and the stage in which we are. So you are joining this industry and this information. I'm glad that you all are here because we are just starting. Like this is starting and you're part of something which is starting today, basically. Uh, in Jure, um, what we believe is that, I mean, and I hope that I conveyed at least this mes message through the presentation is that it's not really that blockchain, I mean, we need to use blockchain everywhere and anywhere and, uh, you know, uh, this is a revolution or something like that. We do believe that blockchain can bring huge benefits, can tackle a lot of uh, problems which are there today in the world, uh, mostly transparency related um, and, of, and, you know, yeah, mostly transparency related. And really what we, con I mean, what we do ourselves every time that we need to think of, okay, should this feature have block, I mean, uh, do we need to involve blockchain in any way in this feature? We try to think of the pros and cons and why that should be there and not there. So what uh, the process that we go through, it's what we call a validation. And, uh, you know, we ask uh, our potential users, uh, of course, legal professionals, uh, do you think this would make sense? Uh, 
what if instead it's it's stored in a centralized server will it be a big problem do you see any corruption possible if we store it there will it be a challenge etc cetera, etc cetera. so we do a validation in which we ask and we validate what's really the the right way of proceeding and uh, as i said before there are pros and cons uh, blockchain in a way it's uh, uh, it brings also uh, major development costs. It's not like creating a normal website. It's cr creating a dApp. It's a very complex uh, task right now. And, uh, you know, in every step, we ask ourselves, does it bring benefit? If it does, is that benefit worth, you know, taking care of costs, not uh, really user-friendly experience, and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of uh, questions that we ask ourselves every day. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope that I conveyed um, to you the, the, the message that uh, this industry is uh, just starting out. And the initiatives like this webinar are exactly because we want to bring more awareness to people like you that might think of their own idea about how to use blockchain, about you know uh, just curiosity, more information, uh, and so on and so forth. I really hope that the message that went through is that it's really the time to get involved. It's really the time to get curious about these things. So I'm really hoping to see quite a few questions. So I'm just disabling my screen and I'm joining you. Here we go, Fede. Okay, let me check. Wow, oh, so many guests that... Correct. The jersey that I've showed from Mexico uh, was from the 2005, 2006 years. So yes, correct. That's correct. And uh, yeah, it was used in the World Cup of 2006. Correct. Wonderful. Uh, Fede, uh, should I pick uh, some questions myself if they're there? Okay, I think Fede. Fede, can you hear me? Uh, there is a question from Giovanni Caponetto. Okay, I guess okay. I'm not hearing you guys. Just one. Okay. Fede, uh, let me just uh, uh, come back to the room. Uh, I guess that Federico is having a problem right now and he cannot speak. I think so. so yeah. fine, fine, fine. I, I don't know what happened with live stream, but I couldn't speak and it, it was creating a lot of frustration to me. But now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, problem. I, no worries. Uh, no worries. So can I just say one thing before you go to the questions, which is uh, that I would like to just remind everyone that we have a quality feedback form that uh, I'm going to paste right now on the chat. And it's a really fast one to three minutes. Maybe you can take it before, we, before you leave from the webinar and it would be really, really valuable for us because if you have enjoyed this webinar today, it's also because we have done a number of webinars before and we have seen a lot of feedbacks coming from other communities and we could tailor our uh, activity the best way possible to deliver our best uh, result. So that any, any answer to this, uh, this feedback form would be really, really helpful as any question that you have done so far. So coming to the questions, um, the thing is that I also want our speakers to come on stage yeah. and talk. So do you think you can you can you can take it in five minutes, all the questions that you have? Uh, or at least yeah, I, I'll just answer a couple. Then uh, let's welcome our guests, okay. our guests yeah. as well. Um, let me go ahead. And I love that Rogelio has asked so many questions. Great Rogelio. And uh, let us know how your name is pronounced, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Okay, so would you call it a dApp, an application running in a private blockchain? Um, yes, I would call it a dApp. Uh, so for those that don't know, blockchain could, can be public and private. 
if it's public, anyone can access the network. So for example, Bitcoin is a public uh, uh, blockchain. So anyone can become a Bitcoin node and you can par be part of the network. Uh, in, in the case of the private ones, instead, uh, let's say that you have a big law firm, uh, which has presence in uh, 10 countries. You could create your own blockchain uh, network that connects all your uh, branches and uh, if you build uh, an application that runs on a private blockchain, yes, it's a decentralized application. Philosophically, maybe we can discuss that, but technically it is. I hope that answers your question, Rogelio. Then, um, okay, I would like to answer the other one from Rogelio, but I'll go with Giovanni. In fairness, <laughs> uh, let's go with Giovanni. So for Luca, philosophical question. I like this. Is it the middleman the real problem or the lack of transparency in that? Better world without middlemen, like a lot of unemployment, or where you know how much of the final price is spent in each hopes and maybe making it more decent? Yes, um, great, great question. Uh, I can see in cases, uh, for example, supply chain, logistics, shipping, real estate, you know, um, Traditionally, there are a lot of middlemen in the process because it's uh, they're bringing a value. They do something which is valuable. Um, what we foresee is that, yes, in the first place, blockchain uh, should bring transparency in these processes. Uh, for example, um, you know, in a supply chain, making sure that, uh, you know, that the, the, the good has uh, followed certain steps. Uh, and, you know, when it switches ends, you know, having that process transparent, it's uh, already a great improvement on how things are managed today. Uh, but it's true that this will bring the cost up instead of down, right? Because we are adding another component to the to the flow. Uh, indirectly, mm, this brings other costs down, but, you know, it's always, again, pros and cons. Um, removing middlemen, it's some middlemen, it's something that uh, ideally, um, we should uh, pursue uh, on a long term. So making sure that, you know, the middleman gets uh, a chance of re up upgrading its skills so that it can be useful in the process in another way or in things that can't be automated and technology can't address. Uh, why I'm saying this is because uh, we would like, you know, everyone to bring the value in the economic flow in the economic um, exactly as as much as a lawyer would do for example giving his uh, you know his uh, legal uh, skills for a client or, or something like that right uh, so if we can automate something because it's just a matter of for example um, you know uh, calculating things you you know previously there were people that were calculating uh, stuff right but if i if i can use technology to to calculate uh, the same things uh, it's uh, more cost effective time efficient why should i go back just for the sake of keeping you know employment <laughs> in that sense but yes we should go gradually we should give the opportunity to these people to upgrade their, sk their skills and to you know, take their value, which has been done in a certain way, embrace technology, and, you know, do it better in a more efficient way. Exactly as, you know, a lawyer, for example, now that is attending a webinar like this is doing, is trying to understand better how it's technology made and it's uh, done, and how we can use that technology to provide better services. So I strongly believe in that. I hope this answers your question, Giovanni. Fede, to you. Thank you very much. And um, that's it. We are moving towards our last speech today. So I'm very happy to invite Irving Yamas to, to join uh, our stage with us. Uh, I hope that the process will be very easy and smooth without waiting too much. This platform is very interesting. I mean, Livestorm app platform with the one we are using for webinars is very interesting. A lot of, oh, OK, yeah, we, we had in. Okay, so um, Irving will be introducing himself. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you from all the Jure team for having participated so far. It was a lovely, um, it was a lovely webinar. Our last speech today will be delivered in Spanish. Uh, for uh, I mean, uh, 
because the the, the community today is almost uh, from Spain, uh, I mean from Mexico and Spanish speakers. So I uh, I hope that you will be also liking this uh, intervention. Thank you very much, Irving, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Rico. Actually, thank you to you, Alessandro, and all of your team to give us the opportunity to share this knowledge with our community. I think this is very important and hope it is useful to everyone. Uh, I, this, you, this webinar is different. We will search now for English to Spanish and let us start. Uh, retomando un poco de lo que comentaba eh, Luca, las aplicaciones descentralizadas definitivamente van a tomar muchísimo impacto en lo, que, en lo que viene de los años, debido a que van a ayudar a un conjunto muy específico de aplicaciones a poder funcionar y poder agregar más legitimidad a varios procesos que se están corriendo actualmente en plataformas que probablemente puedan ser susceptibles a modificaciones. También, retomando lo que mencionaban hace un momento, eh, uno de los miembros de, de YUR, es que las disputas en, en la actualidad conllevan mucho tiempo y mucho dinero para poderse resolver. Eh, como mencionaba Rogelio, eh, aproximadamente tardan un año poderse resolver en México y en el caso de Estados Unidos pueden tardar hasta dos años y pueden costar el 45% del valor de lo que se está el ADR eh, se conoce como métodos alternativos y de solución de controversias aquí en México se permite la mediación la conciliación y el arbitraje que van a permitir ayudar a resolver conflictos entre varias personas Y bueno, como ya mencionaban también en la plática, un ADR se puede convertir en un ODR, ¿no? O sea, podemos pasar toda esta información o todos estos mecanismos que tenemos de una, de, para resolver problemas a una plataforma eh, electrónica descentralizada en donde las personas van a poder resolver sus necesidad de estar acudiendo personalmente, ¿no? Inclusive van a poder utilizar todos los beneficios que estas plataformas pueden conllevar como el hecho de tener expertos en la materia en cualquier parte del mundo, además de tener contratos que son adecuados a las necesidades que ellos están buscando. En el caso, por ejemplo, de, de, de Yur, que es una plataforma bastante interesante, ellos están habilitando una plataforma que va a permitir que abogados o cualquier persona que quiera llevar a cabo un contrato, o sea, porque podrán ser un abogado o cualquier persona que quiera tener alguna forma de poderse eh, ayudar a que no tenga un, un problema en, la, en el futuro, También otras plataformas lo que hacen es que tú puedes pagarles a ellos en una moneda estable. En el caso de Yuri, pues, les tienes que pagar una moneda que se llama Yuri o una moneda este, que sea un stablecoin. Y también este mercado de, de, del online dispute resolution es, bueno, en el, ahorita en el caso de, de la resolución de problemas, en Estados Unidos aproximadamente tiene un costo de 437 miles de millones de dólares. Y se planea o se tiene, se tiene este, preveído que en el 2021 este costo se incrementará a ser billones de dólares, lo cual deja un plan para que todas las personas que, bueno, principalmente los abogados, se incluyan en este tipo de plataformas y puedan tomar un poco más de ventaja con respecto a estas nuevas tecnologías. Eh, en el caso de, de, de estas nuevas plataformas, lo que están ofreciendo son varias cosas. La primera es que tú puedes crear tus contratos de una manera muy sencilla. Esto es inclusive solamente arrastrando cláusulas, porque actualmente lo que tienes que hacer es tener un documento. No escribes todas las cláusulas que quieres tener para poder evitar eh, o bien poder resolver una disputa en el futuro de una manera más sencilla. Sin embargo, en el caso, por ejemplo, de Yur, lo que se puede hacer es tú puedes arrastrar cláusulas para poder estar construyendo tu contrato de una forma mucho más amigable. Y también se pueden ofrecer que no solamente se llama ahí, no tienes por qué reinventar la rueda. Si la rueda ya está ahí, pues hay que utilizarla. Entonces, puedes utilizar un contrato que previamente alguien ya hizo y que tú puedas utilizar en algún caso que tengas en particular. Eh, pueden, existen tres capas eh, actualmente. Está la, la, la capa de, de la corte, que es una capa que después de que tú, más bien, después de que se resuelva el conflicto en, en esa capa, lo que se espera es que se tenga un resultado que sea acorde a la Convención de Nueva York Y esta puede ser vinculante legalmente. Eh, y se espera que este se pueda ser por una disputa de alto valor. En un...
es un no, no, no son muy costosas, no es que está en juego. Y bueno, aquí se permite que cualquier participante pueda contribuir a ese tipo de, 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 de capa. Y se, se tiene que ver con algo, con algo como de teoría de juegos para ver quiénes van a poder ser como parte de, de ese proceso. Y por último, tenemos una, comunidad, una capa de comunidad en la cual va a haber una serie de expertos que van a estar habilitados para poder participar en ciertas áreas o en ciertas disputas basado en, en, en el tipo de temática que está, está hablando. También, retomando lo que mencionaba hace un momento, hablando mucho de la parte de smart contracts, ¿no? Entonces, antes de, de para hacer un, un pequeño summarize de todo eso, eh, hablemos que existen, o sea, podrían decir que hay cuatro clasificaciones de contratos. Tenemos los, los, los contratos tradicionales, que son el que está en papel, que tu persona lo firman y llegan a sin de esta manera, lo que puede causar es que se va a ser un punto muy, muy lento y muy costoso, porque es como se ha venido haciendo a lo largo de los años. Después de esto, como te mencionaba Luca, hay plataformas que te permiten hacer tus propios contratos. Tú puedes eh, utilizar una de esas plataformas que ellos te dicen, ¿sabes qué? Esta, este, este, esta, esta template, esta, esta, este documento ya está listo para resolver este tipo de conflictos y te permite hacer esto, ¿no? Entonces, tú lo compras, se lo compras a una persona, lo prellenas y ese ya es el que utilizas en tu, en, en, para que lo puedan firmar, ¿no? De ambas partes. Sin embargo, lo que tiene es un poquito más pesado, sin embargo, es y, al igual es igual de lento y si hay una disputa va a tardar después de esto tenemos una evolución que son los smart contracts eh, eh, agregados por o más bien propuestos por Nick Sabo los cuales nos van a permitir que de una manera automatizada se puedan crear eh, una transacción o se pueda realizar acá una transacción entre dos entre dos entidades después de que se cumplan ciertas eh, condiciones y por último tenemos algo que también ya mencionaron que son los Smart Legal Contracts o contratos ricardianos, que son Smart Contracts, o sea, tienen, tienen la parte de codificación, sin embargo, también tienen elementos de lenguaje natural para que puedan ser interpretados por una persona. Hay algunas limitaciones con respecto a los, a los Smart Contracts. Como deterministas, en el caso de que no tengan toda la información que se necesita para poder llevar a cabo una, una operación, en este caso, pues, Estamos en un mundo que todavía no está tokenizado, entonces hay elementos que están fuera de la, de la realidad de la blockchain que necesitan una interacción humana para poderse llevar a cabo. Y también hay otro tipo de, 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 de contratos, smart contracts, que son los deterministas, que son smart contracts que tienen todo la, todos los assets y toda la información eh, contenida dentro de la blockchain y van a permitir llevar a cabo operaciones de una manera que, ning, que el humano no tiene ninguna intervención. Si me van a tomar el smart contract y este automáticamente hace un cambio de de propiedad sobre algún objeto. Esto se puede ver si tú quieres hacer un intercambio de, de, de criptoactivos o una, una, una moneda virtual. Tú puedes mandar a las monedas, se puede mandar todo lo que se tenga que mandar al smart contract y una vez que el smart contract valida que esta información es correcta, lleva a cabo el, el envío de la cambio de propiedad entre, entre las dos entidades que están llevando a cabo esta, esta contribución. También hay algunos gaps, como ya se mencionaba en la parte de no determinista, que tú puedes crear un smart contract y ese smart contract, digo, tiene, tiene mecanismos como los oracles que van a permitir poder interactuar con información que está fuera de la blockchain y nos va a permitir poder agregar esa información en, 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 en la parte automática de, de, del smart contract. Sin embargo, se le puede también llegar a incluir algún mecanismo o se le puede, se, propone, se podría proponer agregar un mecanismo en el que si hay un inconveniente en el que el smart contract no tiene la información suficiente y ya necesita algo, algo que sea más complejo, por ejemplo, en el caso casa se, se ha pasado a otra persona eh, probablemente si hay una disputa entre quiénes son los herederos y después pasa algo entre los herederos y ya hay una, un problema más complejo lo que se tiene que hacer es a buscar ayuda del de, smart contract puede buscar una ayuda del, del ser humano y de alguna forma poder tratar de llevar a cabo esta resolución de los, de, del conflicto y bueno este esto es en general ahorita Gersain les va a estar platicando un poco más acerca de las regulaciones en méxico para que este tipo de mecanismos sean vinculantes y sean aceptados por en, en cualquier situación. Hola, ¿qué tal? Este, pues bueno, en la, en la cuestión legal te, te tenemos muchos temas que, que abordar por, por cuestiones de tiempo, eh, se serán muy breves. Pues bueno, Jursen es una gran plataforma ya que, pues bueno, tiene la creación de las plantillas, aparte del mercado de las mismas y tiene una resolución de disputas basado en blockchain. 
Eh, asimismo, pues tiene tres cortes, que bueno, que está la capa corte la, y, y las otras dos capas. Bueno, la capa corte es muy interesante porque es un arbitraje totalmente eh, donde los laudos arbitrales son reconocibles y están bajo la convención de documental, el arbitraje rápido, el arbitraje ordinario. Y lo que se me hace muy interesante de esta capa es que se pueden resolver disputas de contratos tradicionales, de smart contracts y de smart legal contracts, que son contratos ricardianos, pero aquí es muy importante que se incluya siempre una cláusula de arbitraje adecuada en el contrato. Es muy importante donde se especifique eh, alguna jurisdicción o ley aplicable de algún país donde las personas residan o tengan bienes o servicios o ellos mismos lo decidan y también o, o que también se aplique a los principios internacionales de justicia y equidad. También está la capacidad, la capacidad eh, que, bueno, que de alguna manera ayudan a resolver disputas de menor cuantía, pero que también son muy importantes para, para todas las personas que quieran resolver los problemas muy rápido. También eh, es muy importante mencionar que Yur es muy resistente a la corrupción por tener unos mecanismos descentralizados de gobernanza, tiene eh, mecanismos muy importantes, descentralizados, distribuidos, eh, tiene la resignación de casos, no se pueden eliminar unilateralmente a los árbitros, no existen árbitros corruptos porque tienen sistemas. Pero bueno, a grosso modo, ya para pasar a la cuestión de México, lo que se nos hace es que Yuro ofrece un marco adecuado para la creación de arbitraje obligatorio, donde todos los laudos están acorde a la Convención de Nueva York y a la ley modelo de arbitraje comercial internacional y son de vinculantes, tienen fuerza legal. Ya habíamos dicho que son contratos tradicionales, smart contracts, smart legal contracts, etc. Muy bien, miren, en México las, los ordenamientos principales es el Código Civil Federal, el Código de Procedimientos eh, Civiles y el Código de Comercio. En el Código Civil, en el apartado del consentimiento, el artículo es consentimiento por medios electrónicos. Asimismo, también puede ser la oferta por medios electrónicos y en el artículo 1832, donde habla sobre la forma de 1833, hablo, habla que la, cuando se exige un requisito, cuando sea por un contrato por escrito, también por medios electrónicos. Entonces, es muy importante decir que en México se reconoce los medios electrónicos, la equivalencia funcional, la neutralidad tecnológica. También el artículo 210A del Código Federal de Procedimientos Civiles dice que la prueba de la información en medios electrónicos es viable siempre y cuando también se, se estimará primordialmente la fiabilidad de métodos en que se haya generado, comunicada, recibida y archivada esta información para poder atribuir a las personas con un documento y ser accesible para su ulterior consulta. Posteriormente, el Código de Comercio, que es la principal... Aquí en México, bueno, tiene un capítulo, un título que se llama El Comercio Electrónico en este mensaje de datos, de la digitalización, de las firmas, de los prestadores de servicio de certificación, de reconocimiento de certificados y firmas electrónicas extranjeras, en donde hubo una reforma de que hubo una equivalencia funcional donde los documentos físicos, los documentos electrónicos tenían que tener el mismo valor probatorio que los documentos electrónicos, que los documentos físicos. Es así que también el mensaje de datos, el documento electrónico y la naturaleza tecnológica son principios para el comercio electrónico. Pues bueno, ya en una cuestión de derecho internacional, la, como se menciona en el paper de Jur, que, que yo recomiendo que lo lean, porque independientemente de que explique cómo funciona, pues también es un gran documento que te enseña lo que es los smart contracts y los otros Y aquí menciona lo de la Convención de Nueva York. Eh, pues esta convención es muy importante, a pesar de que deja a los demás ADR fuera, que son la mediación, la conciliación y la negociación, y se basa en el arbitraje meramente. Ya después salen algunas leyes modelos del, de, este, de, del, de conciliación arbitral, algunas leyes modelos como de comercio electrónica, de firma electrónica también. Pero bueno, a grosso modo, en México los laudos arbitrales son vinculantes. Si tú haces, si tú utilizas la plataforma de Yur, puedes tener esa en la capa corte, cuando son de mayor cuantía, que tiene la fuerza legal y es vinculante hacia tu país. Y los otros, las otras cosas, a pesar de que son de menor cuantía, también se resuelven rápidamente. Brevemente, México se adhirió a la Convención de Nueva York en 1971 y a la Convención de Panamá en 1978. Y fue hasta 1989 que hizo una incorporación de la ley de arbitraje del comercio electrónico en México, en el Código de Comercio. 
Después, en el año de 1993, hizo otra modificación al código para incorporar ciertos requisitos. Por ejemplo, en el artículo 1461 del Código de Comercio Mexicano, establece que un laudo arbitral, independientemente del país en que haya sido y para ejecutarse, y para ejecutarse deberá presentarse al juez de primera instancia federal o del orden común competente. Entonces, aquí pareciera que los, los laudos no son totalmente vinculantes, pero simplemente este requisito dice que, que le tienes que dar forma en tu país y también por la Convención de Nueva York. Así que el juez simplemente le da forma y jamás se mete en la cuestión sustanta, sustancial del laudo. Así que tiene esa fuerza legal. Y, y pues bueno, a, a, a grosso modo, eh, nos parece que la plataforma Yur con consentimiento, con principios de voluntad, neutralidad, flexibilidad, este, con los principios mínimos de protección de datos personales, bueno, no mínimos, con la protección de datos personales en México y también de Suiza y también del Reglamento General de la Unión Europea de protección de datos y los mínimos estándares de, del derecho al consumidor. Y, y, pues bueno, como conclusión, es que los sistemas ODR, como YUR, puede ser, pueden resultar particularmente útil para, para hacer controversias derivadas de operaciones transfronterizas de comercio electrónico de poca cuantía. Tenemos las tres capas que, que maneja la aplicación de YUR y, y la cuestión digital, que, que tiene que sus laudos son vinculantes. Y por otra parte, el sistema de las ODR puede aplicarse tanto a bienes y servicios. Ya hemos sabido que la justicia en realidad es muy cara y, pues bueno, en México pues es demasiado lenta. Ah, ahorita por lo del coronavirus, pero, pues los términos están parados, están, están de momento esperando a que el Poder Judicial emita en qué sí se pueden aplicar. Bueno, creo que los en Jalisco ya están activados, pero bueno, esto nos quiere decir que nos tenemos que automatizar y las Online Dispute Resolution son una solución y pues bueno, Jure es una plataforma que cumple con, con la Comisión de Nueva York con las notas técnicas de la resolución de controversias online y que tiene una aplicación descentralizada, distribuida por medio de blockchain, inmutable y, y, y eficaz. Yo quiero recalcar que a todas las personas que quieren utilizar Yur y, y que, bueno, y que quieren utilizar el arbitraje internacional, es muy importante que utilicen una cláusula de arbitraje bien hecha, ya que podríamos cometer el error de que simplemente se ponga la jurisdicción de los tribunales y en otra cláusula se ponga que se someten a la entonces se tiene que hacer una cláusula bien de arbitraje en donde si ustedes quieren llevar su, su convenio contrato ante Yur, pues qué mejor que, que esté bien redactada. Y también si quieren utilizar Smart Contract o Smart Legal Contracts, pues desde un principio lo hagan en la aplicación, con la cláusula en el sistema y posteriormente si existe alguna disputa, pues ahora sí acceder, pero todo eso ya desde un comienzo, desde el contrato, es para prevenir. A priori se resuelven todos los problemas y no a posteriori cuando... cuando Pues bueno, eso en general sería todo lo que, lo que vamos a abordar. Eh, sin duda, creo que México podría abordar y, y tomar la, la aplicación de Yur Y a todas las personas que se están viendo de México, muchas gracias por sintonizarnos. Y... Y bueno, recomendados que se registren en la plataforma de Yur para que conozcan eh, lo que es el blockchain, lo que son los smart contracts, los smart land contracts y los online dispute resolution. Y que también se lean su paper porque es un buen documento que independientemente de explicarte cómo funciona Yur, explica toda la tecnología en general. Gracias. Pues, gracias a todos uh, los otros. Por, uh, this is my Spanish events here, but uh, sí, exacto, excelente conferencia, uh, de verdad. Um, thank you very much also for being so kind with us and to highlight uh, the uh, our white paper that you can find uh, as a link. I have just link. Uh, the white paper, you, the, the page where you can find the white paper from our website is jure.io docs. Okay, so we'll, you will be able to find it there. And uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, we will be meeting again soon because uh, also by listening to you, I, I realized that uh, there are a lot of topics that we could uh, like uh, develop in the future together. So let's keep in touch. 
And uh, I guess the, the, the webinar is over because we have gone five minutes uh, after the, the end of it. And uh, I will be uh, saying goodbye from all the Jure team. And uh, thank you very much for your speak, uh, for your speech. Um, for, to both our uh, guest speakers. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank thanks, you. thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.